Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So it is that time of the week again for a Q&A session. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions this week. Uh, let's dive right in. So, of course, I ask myself kind of painful questions. I don't know why I do that. Uh, the first one, what is the most important question when it comes to investing? So I've thought a little bit about that. How I would answer that one is... The most important question is, what is your goal? Okay, and the second part of the question is, is that goal achievable by studying, you know, great investors of the past and present? Have they been able to do it? Have you set yourself uh, a realistic goal? Okay, and based on that, based on other people who have been able to achieve it, what have they done, right? What has their process been? There is so much advantage to... Uh, cloning or at least borrowing from great investors what their process was to achieve those goals. So getting very clear on what it is that you're trying to achieve and is it achievable and, and what is the mix of luck and skill uh, that's needed in order to do it. So uh, next one, thoughts on investing in Japan, particularly the trend of Japanese companies piling cash creating a false sense of downside protection, and the average CEO not caring about shareholders in comparison to the West. So, you know, if you guys are going anywhere outside of your native country, for me, it's the U.S., anywhere outside of the U.S., there's really a lot to learn, uh, in my opinion, uh, to, to really feel comfortable, at least for myself, with an investment. Uh, and Japan is, you know, no different from, from any other country in that sense. There's nuances that are particular to Japan. And, um, you know, uh, Frank mentioned a few of these here, piling cash, uh, not caring about shareholders. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of value to, to be found in Japan right now, um, especially compared to the U.S., uh, and you know, it's, it really comes down to, are you comfortable, uh, enough with the business, you know, that, that you're studying, uh, to pull the trigger on that investment. So rather than talk about the country as a whole, I, I'm much more inclined, you know, to get into the nitty gritty of particular investment opportunities in Japan. Is there a false sense of downside protection or is there actually downside protection. It really comes down to understanding the business. Uh, same with the CEO, looking at the history of how the CEO uh, has made capital allocation decisions um, for, that, for that company. Uh, are they treating shareholders fairly or do they have other motives uh, when they're making decisions like that? So again, it's really just understanding the uh, particular situation of, of an individual business uh, that, that one would choose to invest in in Japan. Uh, Jeremy, do you ever wake up one day and randomly change your conviction on a position? This seems especially vulnerable in positions that one has shamelessly cloned. Uh, yeah, I mean, if... if if you're kind of blindly copying great investors into a position, uh, there's definitely vulnerability when it comes to, you know, something seems to change, uh, whether it's the price or you hear something in the news, uh, it can really kind of rattle, um, you know, how you feel about, about that position very quickly because you don't have that solid foundation that's based on, you know, the, the business being a great business. Uh, this hasn't happened to me just kind of waking up one day and, and change my mind on a, on a position. Uh, cause it's, you know, it's usually I put a fair bit of thought into each investment that I make. Um, but you know, big, big news does come about. And, uh, sometimes that, that news means the investment case has changed. And if that's the case, uh, any reasonable person would take in that new information and, you know, act, act on it appropriately. So um, 
hasn't really happened to me, but it could. Um, and it's, it's a good reminder that when, you know, when you buy into a company, it's super helpful to understand the few key metrics that really drive that business over the next decade or two. Uh, so you really know what to look at. You understand when the story has changed and when you might need to reevaluate that investment. How do you stop yourself from looking at your portfolio every day and making dumb decisions? Uh, because of my bad habit of frequently looking at my portfolio, I have too many data points and it causes me to pay attention to the short-term movements instead of the grander vision. Yeah, this is a huge issue uh, for a lot of people. One of the things um, that I've done, so my uh, the bigger portfolio that I have is through TD Ameritrade, okay? Um, and it's, it's, you know, I don't have the app, uh, I assume TD Ameritrade has an app, but I don't have it. And so it would be kind of cumbersome to log into my account and check my positions. Um, so I don't do it. You know, I don't look at my positions more than like once a quarter in TD Ameritrade. Um, I do have Robinhood as well, and I find that I check those much more frequently. Uh, definitely way more frequently than is helpful, okay? So that's one idea. Find a platform that's not the most user-friendly in terms of logging in and, you know, making buy and sell orders. That could actually be an advantage. Uh, it's also helpful to just remind yourself, you know, commit to yourself. This is how often I'm going to check on my positions, and I'm not going to do it any more often than that because, you know, this is the result if I do check on it every hour, or however often it is. Um, it's not helpful, right? If it leads to making bad decisions. Uh, so I think, you know, especially in a, the age that we live in, where there's an app for everything, and in five seconds I could log in and check my stock portfolio in Robinhood, uh, we need to actively design how we interface with these brokerages, um, know ourselves, and set up systems where we're not sabotaging what we should be doing, what we know that we should be doing with our investments by checking them too often and getting wrapped up in short-term price fluctuations. So well, it's a great question. It's, it's definitely something I've noticed in myself using platforms like Robinhood. Um, so, and I'm sure there are apps too, where you can, you know, set um, how often you can access different apps on your phone. That, that might be helpful as well. Um, so there, there's some ideas. Uh, who are your best five gurus worthy of cloning and letting them do the homework? Simply as cloning the best ideas and go fishing the rest of the year. I do like that idea. Um, favorite gurus, Monish Pabrai, uh, Lee Lu, um, Seth Klarman, and then there's some smaller ones like um, Bonsai Partners. Why do I always forget his name? It's, it's terrible. Um, the guy who runs Bonsai Partners. Um, and then who else? Uh, there's a bunch. 13F season is coming up, so I'm going to ma be making a video uh, about this. But I, I'm really still trying to drill down into the smaller uh, great investors. You know, investors who run less than, say, half a billion assets under management, somewhere between 100 million and 500 million, um, where they're... You know, they, they've got size in the sense that they've been able to compound capital over, you know, 15, 20 years or so. Uh, but they're not so big that they're limited in, you know, what companies they can buy into because it's just not going to move the needle on their portfolio. So um, it's something I'm trying to refine. And if any of you have favorites, uh, let us know in the comments. That would be awesome. 
Uh, can you make a video of stocks in your portfolio? Probably these are your high conviction ideas at this point in time. So I've actually thought a bit about this, uh, and I mentioned it recently in, uh, I think it was Punch Card um, with four other YouTubers that I'm doing Punch Card investing with every week. Uh, the more I kind of talk out about my portfolio and drill in um, why I like certain positions, the harder it becomes to change my mind, okay? Uh, if the story changes, if something happens that's kind of negative on the company, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm too vocal about it, right, uh, it, it makes it difficult to um, be rational, when the story changes, and so um, I, I don't, I don't really want my YouTube channel to be about me giving stock tips, okay, or or me, you know, sharing with you guys what my favorite uh, investment ideas are. I think that's really going to be a disservice both to you, both to the viewer, and to myself. I, I really want to share what I'm learning around investing process and you know, help you guys learn how to make your own investments. Because the things I'm investing in probably aren't the things that you guys should be investing in, right? We, we both understand very different things. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's, if you're just cloning my ideas, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very weak foundation if something changes with the business and, you know, it's, it's not a recipe for success, I don't think. So that's why I'm, uh, I'm not really making videos kind of revealing all of the positions in my portfolio. I mean, I've, I've talked a lot about what I hold currently uh, in the past. Most of my current positions I've, I've talked about in previous videos, um, but I don't really want to make content that drills in where I stand on uh, those companies. So sorry for that, uh, but I do think it's gonna be better for me and and you guys as well. Uh, what are some of the tools you use to research a company? Thanks to you, I discovered Ticker, but are there more? Uh, I'm sure there are more. Um, specifically, I'm looking for some tools that show stock buybacks done by a company over time. Yeah, buybacks, uh, I've found a little tricky to track down as well. Uh, you, uh, maybe you got this from Pabrai with his free lunch portfolio, looking at the Uber cannibals. Um, I don't know really of any screener um, that allows you to find companies that have been doing a lot of buybacks. Uh, but if you look in ticker at a specific company, you can pull up um, the balance sheet and look at uh, number of shares outstanding over time. So you can expand. Let's just give an example rather than me trying to talk through this when it's so much easier just to show it. So we're going to sign in to ticker. Um, let's, look, let's just look at NVR because I know they do a lot of buybacks. So for NVR, which is a home builder, uh, come down here to financials, <clears throat> balance sheet, and if we scroll down, we can find total shares out on filing date. I'm going to expand kind of the time frame I'm looking at. I can go back as far as 2004. So um, total shares out on filing date. I assume this is in millions, 6.72 million. And then you go all the way over 3.64, okay? So over like 17 years, uh, we go from 6.7 million down to 3.6 million, okay? So that's pretty aggressive buybacks over time for NVR. Uh, so that's how you can do it for a, a particular company. Again, I don't know how to screen for that. I'm sure there are ways. Uh, what other tools do I use to research a company? Um, obviously, you go to the sec.gov website. You can pull annual reports. You can pull quarterly filings. Um, 
I can look at, you know, in Data Roma, I can type in the ticker and see which super investors own it. Uh, go to Twitter and type uh, the dollar sign and then the ticker for the company. So, you know, dollar sign cost for Costco. You can see what other people on, on Twitter are saying about the company, if there are any uh, write-ups. You can look at Value Investors Club, see if there are any write-ups there. Uh, you go to Value Line, and you can pull, like there's a one-page report for each company, typically in the US. Uh, and there's just so much data on that one page. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different resources to use. Um, those, those are some of the ones I use. Like many value investors, I'm not bullish on crypto. Fair enough. How long do you think this crypto bull run would have to continue before value investors like me admit we missed something? It's an interesting question. Um, I mentioned recently Bill Miller, who's you know a, a very well-regarded value investor, very highly regarded, came out that he's owned Bitcoin since like two or three hundred dollars per coin. Um, so it seems like you know there, there's going to be more and more that comes out around value investors being involved in crypto. Um, how long does the bull run have to continue before value investors? You know, to me. Crypto, it's it's not really value investing, okay? And I'm sure there are people who have other opinions about this. Uh, if you know, I don't know that there's a well-established way to value cryptocurrency, okay? Uh, particularly in the way that value investors like to use, which is like a discounted cash flow valuation. You can't do that with crypto because crypto doesn't spin off cash, right? It's not a business that generates earnings and free cash flow over time. So you've got to use a different, a different measure of you know, determining what crypto is worth. Uh, certainly you can talk about comparing it to gold. If you're talking about Bitcoin, it's like digital gold where you look at, all right, uh, what is the total value of gold out there? What is the value of the gold market? How much of that percentage-wise could Bitcoin capture? Um, there, there's ways to do it like that. Um, but I personally really like to invest in, in a way where I'm projecting out cash flows, right? Uh, and, and discounting those back. And I, I can't do that with crypto. So... Uh, Value investors like me who use that same approach, uh, crypto just it doesn't really fit into that framework and it could go to the moon. Uh, and, and many rational value investors will see that as, well, I didn't miss anything. It's just it's out of my circle of competence. I don't know how to value it. So it's fine. Right. It can do whatever it wants. Um, Maybe I feel bad that I missed it because I didn't gamble on it, right? That that's one way to look at it. But you know, it, I don't think anyone should feel bad about missing out on something because they didn't take a gamble on it, right? That's this is not how I think about investing. So uh, possibly never, even if it goes to the moon. Uh, I I don't know that we have to admit that we missed something, but it certainly gets harder and harder the more. You know, it, it just goes goes crazy right before it's it's difficult uh, in some ways to sit on the sidelines with something that's just going crazy, absolutely crazy. But, you know, uh, Howard Marks would say trees don't grow to the sky. Right. What, what goes up will come down. So uh, I think. If, if we don't remember that, it's easy to get sucked into uh, something like crypto just as it's, you know, really frothy and about to, to take a downturn. So uh, be careful about that uh, and realize that's, that's how market psychology works. Risk is highest uh, when people are most euphoric and there's a lot of euphoria in crypto right now. So... 
it's likely that it's, it's probably a pretty risky proposition right now. I may be wrong, of course. Uh, what are your thoughts on Etsy dropping 15% this week? Will you dig further into the company? Um, I didn't even know that Etsy dipped 15%. Uh, to me, Etsy, it, it's just too big. It, it, I kind of missed Etsy is, is how I'm looking at it at the moment. Um, you know, Pabrai, he's really using the model of, I want to find companies that are under 500 million market cap uh, because... You know, most companies don't get larger than five billion, much less fifty billion. So if I'm shopping much greater than five hundred million, it's it's really tough to find a ten or one hundred bagger. Um, so you know, I I feel like I missed the boat on Etsy, and I'm fine with that. I'm not going to chase it. So I'm um, I'm going to take a pass. Would you be able to invest in a company with rock solid financials, moat, margin of safety? Uh, price, etc., that you personally don't like and wouldn't even use their product or service. Uh, I wouldn't. You know, if I don't like the business, you know, when I, when I buy into an investment, I think of myself as an owner of that business, and I wouldn't want to own a business that I'm not proud of, right? If I don't like what the business is doing, like for example, I'm not going to buy into a tobacco company, even if it's you know, trading at a PE of one, okay? And I feel like it's a can't miss investment opportunity. Um, I just, I, I don't want to be involved with the business like that. There's some kind of value element that, that I bring into my own investment process. You know, of course, we talk about value investing as in getting a value, but there's also the values, my personal values. What do I want to vote for? with my investment dollars in the world. And, you know, it, it's easy to pass on a business if it doesn't line up with you know, my personal values. Uh, that, that's an easy pass. Uh, please ex explain the business model behind mortgage REITs. Uh, I have two REITs in my portfolio and their business model seems very straightforward, collecting rent, but what about mortgage REITs? Uh, thank you. Glad you're enjoying the Q&A. So um, I've never invested in a mortgage REIT. Um, I'm assuming they just, you know, uh, bundle a bunch of mortgages, right? And, and that's the business. But so you've really got to understand how to value mortgages and how to um, analyze the risk associated with uh, different mortgages. Um, and that's not in my circle of competence, so so I don't go there. But um, yeah, could be an interesting business. I mean, there's a, there's a reason banks love uh, giving out mortgages, right? It's so, it can be so profitable. Now you got to be careful if you're in you know a, an inflationary environment and you're you're giving out mortgages. Um, with a fixed rate, interest rate particularly. Uh, but, you know, it could be an interesting business. Again, it's just not in my wheelhouse, so I, I can't really contribute much to that one. How does one, having a long-term mental framework for holding years or decades, depending on how the business evolves, apply it? Uh, specifically, getting used to not checking the stock price daily or every two days. Interesting, this is the second time a question like this has come up. Uh, which is what I currently do, checking it maybe quarterly or even less. Um, yeah, I think it's it's really important. It's part of the discipline of investing, especially for long-term investors, to not spend time doing things that are counterproductive to to our goals, like holding a company for a decade or more. So... You know, it takes discipline. Uh, it takes prioritization. You know, what what do I need to get done today to become a better investor? Um, focus on those things. Maybe find a brokerage that's not super easy to, to check on prices all day long. Um, put systems in place, right, to, to help you do what you should be doing uh, and to not do what you shouldn't be doing. That's uh, that's the best I can say about that. 
Uh, what do you think are the most important metrics on the financial statements? Well, you know, that, that really comes down to understanding the business and knowing what metrics really move the needle for that particular business, okay? I mean, in general, free cash flow, you know, what, what is the free cash flow growth over time? That's, that's super important. Uh, debt as compared to operating income is, is something I look at when I'm doing kind of an initial filter. Uh, but again, it, it really just comes down to what drives the business. Uh, what are those key drivers of what makes the business great? Or what, uh, what makes it a compelling investment opportunity? Uh, what do you think a reopening play like travel, uh, MSGE, do you think this US, is the USA opening up? Um, yeah, things like this, I, I know there's, there's people who are talking about this in value, uh, not Value Investors Club, corner of Berkshire and Fairfax betting on these reopening plays. I see it from Jeremy Raper on Twitter, uh, talking about how, you know, this is a pretty big focus area of his, the reopening. How do you capitalize on that? Uh, to me, that's kind of shorter term than what I'm interested in, okay? Uh, again, I'm looking for these long-term compounders, uh, great businesses that are going to be, you know, they're just going to get stronger over time. So reopening play, I, I think it's it could be a compelling 50 cent dollar bill, uh, but that's really not where I'm putting my focus and energy. So uh, yeah, there's probably a lot of people who are who are doing the reopening bet on MSGE. Um, do I think U.S. is opening up? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think the U.S. is is going to be opening. Um, there's there's probably a lot of companies that are going to see pretty strong growth as a result of that. But again, it's it's sh too, it's too short term really for for what I'm what I'm looking for. To ephemeral. Uh, I wonder if holding only a few stocks is really a good idea. Thinking about the survivorship bias here, some investors featured in Richer, Wiser, Happier preferred 20 to 100 companies, and it was stated that only 4% of the stocks really moved the needle in the past decades. Right. Would have Nick Sleep been a big deal without choosing Amazon? Yeah, that's something I've been thinking about a lot, actually. Um, because uh, Amazon, I mean, it, without Amazon, I, I think, you know, Nomad would have been a fairly average performer over the, the 13 years uh, that it was around. Um, but, you know, part of it as well is Nomad, you know, Nick Sleep, I think, bought into Amazon in 2005. And he wrote to his investors specifically requesting that they allow him to invest more than 20% into Amazon, okay? So the conviction that Nick Sleep had in Amazon, it kind of makes me want to give him a little bit of a pass on, yeah, it was really only one idea that caused the, the, the tremendous success that, that fund had. Um, because he knew, he had so much conviction that that idea was a great idea, okay? So, you know, there, there's there's power in that. Um, if, you know, I, I think it's also partly a matter of temperament here. Uh, sure, you could probably do well with 20 to 100 companies. Um, the argument against that, it's really hard to understand well uh, that many companies. Um, so you're kind of diluting your best ideas is, is the argument uh, against that. But, you know, you, you've really got to find what works for you, right? Clearly, people have had success investing in 100 companies. Clearly, people have had success investing in a few companies. So I think where you are kind of in between there uh, is largely a matter of temperament and just what you're comfortable with. So... Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's something I've been thinking about. If Nick Sleep had, had missed Amazon, you know, 
And if, if for, for those investors who are considering investing in, in a smaller number, like a handful of companies, and one of those, those doesn't hit, right? One of those doesn't turn out to be a big winner. How does that impact the portfolio versus buying 20 or 30 companies where you have uh, a couple hit? So something to consider. I don't have a clear um, answer for that. That's a great question. Uh, say you had 10 winning stocks in your portfolio, but wanted a more concentrated portfolio of two to four stocks. Uh, I'm curious why you would want a more concentrated portfolio. If you started out uh, with 10, what's, what's driving that desire for more concentration? Would you construct the portfolio by selling six of your lowest conviction, then putting the money into your four favorite, or let the 10 stocks naturally take form over many years until the best couple of businesses naturally become, say, 90% of the portfolio? Um, well, part of the issue with selling the six uh, and then putting money into the four, maybe the four aren't compelling anymore, right? Price is really important when it comes to making good investments. So, you know, you've got to consider, are those four favorites still, you know, uh, strong investments based on where, where they are in price at the moment? Um, yeah, so it, it's, it, it's hard to give gener generalizations about that. I, I think it's really, um, it's so nuanced depending on, you know, what you have in front of you, the hand that you have in front of you in the moment. Um, yeah, tough to answer that. And again, why, why exactly are we moving from 10 down to four, uh, would be my question. Um, yeah. How do you think about when to sell Seritage? So I talked a little bit about this in my live stream with Tom recently. Uh, it's largely, um, I'm watching, I'm watching Guy Spear, I'm watching Monish Pabrai. Uh, I was watching Warren Buffett. He's kind of dipped off the radar with Seritage. Um, thoughts on selling in general? Selling is the toughest part of the game. It really is. It really is because, you know, it's, it's very easy to make the mistake of selling, you know, when you've got like a two or three or four X and missing out on a long-term compounder. And that is a really painful mistake. It's a mistake Guy Spear made with Crystal. Crystal would be a larger position than his entire portfolio now if he had simply held on to Crystal rather than selling at like a 4x gain after a couple of years. So um, I really don't want to make that mistake of selling too early and missing out on a great long-term compounder. So... Um, Fortunately, I know Guy Spear. I know Monish Pabrai. They are also looking for these long-term compounders, right? They are very conscious of selling too early on a company that's going to be a great long-term bet. They've made those mistakes. So uh, in large part, I'm outsourcing my sale decision on Seritage to those two investors, all right? Uh, it, it's as simple as that. And I think... That's a very wise approach when it comes to figuring out when to sell. Um, I don't think there's any shame or there needs to be any ego issues with you know, trying to figure out for yourself uh, when to sell. Shameless clone it, that's, that's what I'm doing with Seritage. Uh, and I have no issue with that at all. Uh, for stocks we want to hold on to for 10 years, Monish Bibrai says to set it and forget it, right? However, the reality can be checking stock prices daily. Again, here we go again. A lot of you guys are checking stock prices very often. It's, it's good to recognize that in yourself and figure out, okay, how do I do something different here? I don't think this would be sustainable for 10 years. Yeah, I mean, think about Amazon early on. I think... In the dot-com uh, crash, Amazon dropped like 90%. If you're checking Amazon every day for like, and it's just dropping like a rock for like almost two years, how likely are you going to be to hold on to Amazon? Okay. If on the other hand, 
uh, you know, you're, you're checking in on Amazon's business every quarter, looking at, you know, the 10Q, reading the annual reports. Um, you know, maybe you're not going to lose much sleep over it, right? Because the business is still sound, right? The business is still growing. Um, I mean, for, for me as a value investor, it's really all about what is the business doing? Is the business getting better? What's happening with the business? And we only find that out really every quarter, every three months. So there's not a lot to do, right? When it comes to stock prices, Mr. Market's going to give you a quote every second, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week. Um, it's up to us about whether we want that information every second, five days a week, eight hours a day. Uh, it's probably not helpful, all right? It may be helpful to set alerts through your brokerage where, you know, I want to know when this stock gets over this price or when it gets below this price. But anything in between, I'm not interested, okay? If maybe I maybe I'm think I'd think about selling at this price, maybe I'd think about buying more at this price. Okay, tell me when that happens. Otherwise, you know, I'm just learning about the business. I'm learning about other investment opportunities. What are your thoughts on this? All right, some stocks SRG are volatile. Absolutely, should we be checking prices regularly? Again, Mr. Market is here to serve us. Okay, if Mr. Market is getting you to make decisions based on price fluctuations, you got to cut out Mr. Market, okay? Mr. Market is a drug that is not serving you. So um, it, it must be impacting quite a few of you, uh, feeling like you're, you know, you have to check frequently uh, that I'm getting these comments. So yeah, let me know in the comments too if you guys have thoughts on this because um, it needs to be addressed. Clearly, we, we need to figure out some ways to cope uh, with this super easy like fix of being able to check prices um, instantaneously on our smartphones. So uh, we got to find some some solutions there. Cheers, Mike, for that question. Deep dive on Topicus. Um, yeah, you know I've been digging into uh, Nick Sleep's Nomad letters to partners. That's really what's been occupying my time. I, I've been diving into Costco as well. Um, so I've been taking my time with those things, uh, which has been great. You know, I've stepped off the treadmill a little bit. I haven't been, I haven't made as much content in the last week because I've been trying to um, take those letters slow and really give them the time that they deserve. Um, so yeah, Topicus isn't on my radar at the moment. It'll be interesting to see uh, what some of the super investors, if any, have bought into Topicus when those come out at the end of the week. Um, and again, there's that great write-up from the, I think it's the 10th man. Uh, check out his write-up on Topicus. Certainly that's um, deeper and higher quality than anything that I would be able to put out right now. Uh, so check that out if you're interested in Topicus. I respect your ESG opinions. Thank you. I'm very concerned with climate change, but heavily invested in oil stocks. Does that make someone a hypocrite? So um, I don't know if you're familiar with Massif Capital, M-A-S-S-I-F, but Massif is also invested in some oil companies and their, their whole thing is uh, it, it's probably unwise to just completely shut out oil and natural gas and, you know, mining companies from the conversation of ESG. Uh, and the reason for that, it, it's not like we can flip a switch and shift from, you know, fossil fuel economy into a completely green economy. There's a transition. And, you know, at Massive, the, the, the opinion is, or the framework is, we need to uh, bet on companies that are helping the transition, okay? And that includes mining companies that are, 
you know, shifting to more sustainable practices. Oil companies that are also transitioning to other sources of energy, right? Maybe better practices. Um, so I, it, it's easy when you think of ESG to just want to push out everything that doesn't immediately seem like it fits into the ESG bucket. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, bringing into the conversation, the ESG conversation, players within industries that are still essential, like mining, like oil and natural gas, uh, rewarding those players that are taking the initiative to kind of expedite the transition to a, a cleaner, uh, greener future. So uh, it's not necessarily, I don't necessarily see it as hypocritical to do that. Um, but if you're just investing in an oil stock, you know, because it seems like a great investment and there's nothing, you know, compelling from an ESG perspective about the company, um, you know, you, you may want to check yourself on that and just see, you know, do I feel comfortable doing that? Or uh, is that not, you know, am I going to lose sleep at night because of that? Or not feel like I'm fully um, in integrity uh, because I'm, you know, putting my dollars, I'm a part owner of this business that really isn't helping the transition that I feel uh, strongly needs to happen. So I uh, hope that helps, Rick. It's a good question. I, I've thought about that quite a bit as well. So anyway, guys, thank you for all the fantastic questions this week. Uh, again, I'm excited to do this every week. This is one of the videos I look forward to uh, more than most of the others each week. So uh, thanks for keeping it interesting with your continued questions. Uh, with that, I will leave you all till the next video. Take care.